So we are going to talk about a new surgical modality I call Star Trek surgery, science fiction to fact. And I'll take you through the story. There will not be a lot of science in my talk, no formulas, no equations. It's mainly about people, human beings, and about technology. Our story begins here with this ge gentleman, Hippocrates, who basically established the ethical rules of the medical profession. Firstly, do no harm. And uh, if you think about it, when y you have in your mind what is a surgical procedure, there's a lot of harm done during a surgical procedure. Basically, it's the only profession that by law, the surgeon is allowed to cut you open and not go to court for performing you know, a felony. What he also did, he established the uh, staging of diseases. So the first line is drug, then the knife, the scalpel, and then the fire. This is ablation, okay? Heating up the tissue and, and basically killing whatever is superfluous or, or unnatural. And if everything fails, then this is considered as incurable. Okay, this was many, many years ago, in the fifth century before Christ. So this is a clip. I hope you know the technology will work for me. And you'll hear What's the your sound. Degree in? Dentistry? How do you explain slow impulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. Okay, so this is the butcher knife. This is a typical argument between doctors in Star Trek, right? It's almost like in house. I don't know how many Star Trek fans there are here. And uh, just for your you know, information, this is the number of patients that die every year from medical errors. And uh, if you compare it to the uh, record of the aviation industry, how many people die in airplane crashes. This is a huge number. I mean, if you compute, it's more than two crashes, crashes per week of a jumbo jet with all the passengers. And with that reputation, nobody would you know, fly. Uh, so just think about it when you enter in hospital. Uh, so imagine you know, a future. This is no joke. Imagine a future where people can walk into the operating room, lie awake on the table, be able to talk with their doctor. There'll be no knife, no cutting, no bleeding, no infection, no hospitalization, no pain. And after the procedure, they'll walk back home and next day to work to their you know, usual routine. Just imagine that. So in Star Trek, they solved it. And you see this device, this is the tricorder. I call it the healer device. And you know, there is in, in, in high tech, there is this notion of killer app, you know, the one that will bring you one million downloads when you put it on the app store. And killer app is, I mean, killer is not a nice name for something that needs to cure people. So I call it the healer app. So Dr. McCoy in Star Trek had th this device. You put it on the patient, it diagnoses it, it cures it without cutting, without opening, without anything. And by the way, those of you who are familiar with the XPRIZE, there is a, a Qualcomm sponsored XPRIZE competition called the Tricorder for coming up with a personal diagnostic device, something that can diagnose everything, everywhere, based on mobile technology, basically. So it, it, it won't be able to cure, but it will be able to provide to do the diagnosis or collect the data and send it to your doctor. So what I'm going to show you basically that the future is here and it is enabled by this new uh, surgical modality, has a terrible name, MR guided focused ultrasound. And it's a combination of two technologies. One is ultrasound and the other one is MR imaging. Now we are all familiar with ultrasound for imaging. I'm sure everyone is familiar with that. And some of you 
maybe most of you are familiar also with the use of ultrasound for breaking kidney stones, a procedure called lithotripsy, using a shock wave. And if you think about it, ultrasound is nothing more than just mechanical energy. It's pressure waves, and you can actually manipulate them by changing the parameters, the intensity, frequency, duty cycle, and so on, and span the whole spectrum, the whole gamut between imaging, where you just you are just looking, to you know using a hammer to break a stone. And what I'll show you is what Hippocrates said about the fire, an effect that uses uh, ultrasound to create uh, focal heating of the tissue in order basically to cook it. It's like, you know, boiled egg. After you boil it, it doesn't matter how long the chicken will sit on it. There will be no chick coming out of it because the proteins are denatured. And, and I put this uh, magnifying glass for a reason because many of you are scientists and you know that uh, acoustics behave much like uh, optics. And acoustics, I mean, sound wave can be focused actually to a point. So what we see here is a setup I put in the lab when I was in Insight Tech. On the right-hand side, you see a transducer, an acoustic transducer. It is this big, like 12 centimeters. It has multiple elements. It's a phased array. And each one of the elements can be controlled individually. And the reason is to be able to focus into the body at varying depth, depending where the tumor or the target is. Okay, And also, depending on the number of elements, you can think about 3D steering, even the ability to steer the beam uh, left and right, uh, rather than uh, doing it mechanically. In this transducer, there are like 200 elements. And <coughs> it is placed outside the body. And here in the setup, everything is immersed in water. An acoustic lab always is, there is a big aquarium where all the experiments are done. <coughs> and on the left-hand side, what you see is basically uh, is a phantom a tissue-mimicking phantom, which is not transparent to ultrasound, uh, fully transparent to ultrasound like water. And it mimics uh, basically the characteristic, acoustic characteristics of uh, human tissue. And what I'm going to do is to operate the transducer to a certain point, focus it in the middle of, of this target, and you'll see the effect. So you'll see now. This is just an illustration where the focus will be. It's just to focus your attention. We'll zoom in. We'll hear you know, the power supply working. And there will be a click, which is the power on. This was the click. And you see now the bubble formed, basically a boiling bubble formed inside. You see this is the result. So there's nothing, no damage, except in the focal point. Okay. And think about this as something you know in your brain, that we want to target a lesion in the brain, not necessarily a tumor. I will talk about it. And you don't want to cut. You want to reach there, ablate it, and that's it, without any collateral damage. <coughs> now, this is not a new trick. I mean, 50, 60 years ago, those pioneers, the Fry brothers and Lars uh, Lexell, is the inventor of the gamma knife, for you know medical devices. Uh, he's a Swedish guy. They knew that ultrasound could be harnessed and focused in order to create a lesion inside the body. And you ask yourself, OK, why don't we have devices like that you know, for the last, I don't know, 50 years? And they were fortunate because they were able to conduct experiment before the FDA was formed, before this 76, 1976 day. So it was much easier to get patients. They tried through a hole in the skull, which is, by the way, by surgeon, neurosurgeon considered not as an operation. I mean, in three minutes, they create a hole in your skull, and, and they have access. Uh, they try to treat Parkinson, for example. And you ask yourself, you know, what happened? Why didn't it made it to the market? And really, the big missing component was closing the loop, an imaging device that will let you um, basically know where you are. Because if you have uh, a device that generates energy from outside the body, focuses it inside, 
you don't know where you will end up because of all kind of aberration, distortion, uh, energy blocks, and so on that you need to visualize in real time. So it's not enough like in, in radio surgery that you know that the beam of particle is going straight into the body, and if you have a, you know, something, a frame of reference outside, you know exactly where you end. This is not the case with ultrasound. So basically, they didn't have a very huge success rate. And in medicine, if you don't have a very huge success rate, it means also that you have some complications. And they didn't make it. So the breakthrough came basically with the availability of uh, imaging modality. And I'll particularly uh, talk about MRI because it has some unique characteristics. So first of all, you know, uh, a quick primer, um, how MRI works. And for that, we have the luxury of going to the web these days. If you take, let's say, a human being and put him in one of these big, very homogeneous magnetic field magnets, then there's a tendency of that magnetic field to line up the magnetic moments of the nuclei, the spin of the nuclei in the hydrogen in your body, which is in your muscle and in your blood. Now put on a radio frequency pulse, say 60 megahertz or something like that, then you can make this magnetization of your hydrogen nuclei, you can turn it 90 degrees away from the direction of the magnetic field. Your magnetic moment will precess if you have coils around, pickup coils, they, it will induce a signal. If I want to see where the signal is coming from in your body, I put on another magnetic field on top of the very homogeneous one that's called a magnetic field gradient. By that I mean it makes the field stronger in one place and weaker in another place. What you do in order to actually get the image that you want, the fine resolution that you need, is you put on magnetic field gradients of different strengths, a series of pulses. That's why if you get an MRI machine, you hear boom, boom, boom. It's all these pulses that we're putting on with different strengths of magnetic field, perhaps even different directions, because we want to get a three-dimensional picture of you. You record all of these data, and when you finish, you can now use what's called Fourier transform. It's a mathematical technique. You can work back to how strong the signal was in each of these uh, voxels. And so this is how the image is developed. OK. So basically, they were blind. This is. Uh, Essentially, the contribution of the MR is the ability to close the loop. And you saw that we get a good anatomical image, so we can uh, actually see and delineate the tumor, the target, to be treated. But then how do we know what was really heated and by how much? And this is really the unique feature that traditional MRI exams do not provide because it is not needed. But in this context, one can measure the temperature rise because of the heating, because the uh, speed of sound, uh, sorry, the uh, spin frequency of the atoms depend on temperature. If, and if there is no movement uh, of the patient or the organ, then the phase changes can be interpreted as temperature changes. There is a linear uh, relationship. And uh, that change can be interpreted as temperature rise and I'll show you later, as an overlay on the image. So this way we can know both where we are and by how much we heat it. And there is a direct correlation between the temperature rise and the viability of the tissue. So if you heat the tissue beyond 60 degrees for less than one second, then it is completely denatured, completely destroyed. OK. So what you're looking, basically, with the combination of the focus ultrasound and MR, you're looking at the operating room of the future. This is how it might look like. There's no big stuff. There is maybe a nurse in the room to talk with the patient. 
The physician is sitting in front of the screen. He works with the mouse. He delineates the tumor. I'll show you. He clicks for liability reason. It's not autonomous or automatic. And uh, he talks with the patient. The patient is awake and can provide feedback on any sensations or whatever feeling she has. Uh, it's not a nice uh, experience to be in, a, in an MR for the duration um, of the treatment because of the noise, it's claustrophobic and so on. But, but at least, you know, we'll see in, in a few moments how you get out of it. So I'm going to uh, show you an example of a typical treatment uh, in the brain. And here we are talking not about tumors, because from a regulatory perspective, it's a much more difficult uh, path to approve the device, but on uh, functional disorders. By that I mean things like Parkinson that most people are aware, or essential tremor, which is even more prevalent than Parkinson. And the main difference, just for you to know, in Parkinson there is tremor all the time, okay? And in essential tremor, it's only during the movement of the hand. So only when we want to move something, then there is tremor. And still, by the way, the scientific community doesn't know whether it's in the feed forward loop. I mean, is it a problem of planning the motion? Or is it a problem of the feedback loop, of getting you know, the feedback from whatever sensors and, and correcting the motion? But anyway. Um, there are 10 million people with their diagnosed in the US. Um, and this is one of them. He's patient number uh, five uh, that took the uh, phase one uh, clinical trial, clinical study in the US. He was a professor in the uh, University of Virginia, professor to, uh, for history. And he essentially had to quit uh, teaching because at a certain point in time, he couldn't uh, really present at class. His tremor was so uh, big that you know, nobody understood his handwriting. Of course, he was limited uh, also because he couldn't drive. And socially, he couldn't participate you know, in social events because if he would take a glass of wine, everything would be spilled out. Eating cereal was also a problem. And this is his handwriting at the morning of the treatment. OK? Anybody volunteer to read it? Okay. Uh, good, good try. Good try. Look at this, and I'll show you later how it looks after the treatment. Uh, but y you agree that it, it needs a lot of effort to read it, and this is not the most severe one. And this is another example. Just to demonstrate to you you know, the cereal eating feet. What does it mean? So think about those people. I mean, the quality of life. I mean, it's one yeah. thing to be alive, and it's another thing okay. to so be with, with good quality. Oh, that's it. We should see it later. OK, so this is the device. OK, this is the transducer for the brain system. What I showed you earlier is a transducer for ab abdominal organs, which is much smaller. This is for the brain. The reason we need such a large cap or uh, hair dryer, if you like, is because uh, a lot of the acoustic energy is absorbed by the skull. And in order to minimize uh, skull heating, we need to distribute the energy penetrating the brain over the largest surface possible. There are 1,000 elements here. You see seven segments, but each of them is segmented uh, to multiple elements. 1,000 elements, again, each of which can be controlled uh, for phase and amplitude. And the, there are two challenges, actually, with the brain. The first one I mentioned it's the heating of the skull. And the whole interface between the transducer and the skull uh, is basically cooled actively with cold water during the treatment. And this is to avoid damage you know, to the dura, to the outer surface of the brain. But the other challenge is that the skull is not an ideal hemispheric uh, object. And the thickness 
is not uniform. And in order to be able to focus the energy inside the skull, you need to correct for those aberrations. And, and this is why uh, we need so many elements. And in a moment, I'll tell you how it is done. But first, let's see an interview how a procedure looks like. Again, we are going to the internet to uh, ABC. For some reason it does oh, okay. It's downloading, so. It is all about healthy living, and tonight a revolutionary new approach to surgery. Doctors using sound waves instead of scalpels. It is fast, the recovery time can be measured in seconds, and some of the initial results suggest that this could hold out hope for so many medical problems. Here's ABC's Dr. Richard Besser. It seems like science fiction, surgery without a scalpel. For Phyllis Harbor Walker, this experimental treatment offered okay. hope. And your nose. Like 10 million Americans, Phyllis suffered from essential tremors. Um, felt a little bit on the worthless side, you know. A neurological disorder that makes her shake uncontrollably. Like At church, this. I stopped taking communion. I couldn't do it. She couldn't hold a cup couldn't write until her doctor used sound, ultrasound, to change her life. Touch me with your untreated hand. It's hard to do. Yes. Now let me see you with your treated hand. That's almost perfect. Ultrasound therapy is already FDA approved to treat fibroids. As part of this study, her doctor used it to sear away a misfiring brain circuit controlling her right hand. A knife is replaced by this. That's correct. So the Dr. Jeff Elias is the pioneer who performed her surgery at UVA. And this transducer is, uh, contains 1,024 elements. And it's that energy which is cutting the brain. Just like if you took a magnifying glass and focused it on a leaf. Traditional surgery requires two separate operations with weeks of recovery time. But with ultrasound therapy, treatment can take as little as 10 seconds. There's almost no recovery time and fewer complications. It's just the feeling of the vibration of something. So, I mean, ultrasound could really change the approach in, in neurosurgery. Not just neurosurgery, but really almost any disorder of the body. Cancers, strokes, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, they're really all potentially treatable. I wanted to write to my two grandsons who were in Afghanistan and Iraq. This is Phyllis's writing before and then. It was immediate. I could write my name. A new life for Phyllis, a breakthrough in medicine. Dr. Richard Besser, ABC News, Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. So, we know that she was in the hospital. She volunteered, sorry, she volunteered for, for a clinical study. There is a risk in clinical studies. And only because she wanted uh, to write to her uh, grandchildren. So. Okay, so this is what we saw the patient view. This is what the physician sees. Basically, he gets uh, slices or strips with MR images. And these are the planning images that are taken uh, once the patient goes into the machine. He selects the one where the treatment is going to be given. And in this case, for essential tremor, it's inside the thalamus. Thalamus is, is a uh, organ in the middle of the brain, so you understand that in order to reach there with an electrode like in PBS, um, in the, you know, brain stimulation uh, device, uh, you have to cross a lot of healthy tissue in the way. Um, and really you need to ablate maybe two millimeters. It's a really few uh, spots that you need uh, to induce in order to get the effect that we saw. Okay, so he delineates uh, the area, and now there's a question, how do we know that we set up the patient correctly? You saw that you know, the patient is uh, connected to uh, the transducer, you put him in the MR. How do we know that we focus in the right place when we 
press this button sonically. You see there, the blue one. And here, this is where the MR, unique capability of MR to measure temperature change comes into rescue. Because what we can do is basically heat up only by a few degrees, which are not causing any damage, any irreversible damage. The MR is sensitive enough to measure it. So you see where the hot spot is. And you can actually realign the focus with the target after you see where it happens. In fact, today, uh, and it, it is still experimental, you can even find it without heating up. Because remember, I told you that ultrasound is a mechanical force. And when you focus it into uh, the tissue, it's like, uh, like a needle you know, touching the tissue and pushing it a little bit. And the MR actually can measure the amount of displacement uh, of the tissue. It's measured in micro, and the MR is sensitive enough to measure uh, the displacement in real time. It takes something like 20 milliseconds, and you get a spot without it heating up at all. OK. We saw that. So you see, this is the graph that you, we get in real time every three, two, three seconds or so. It depends on the strength of the magnet and on the model of the magnet. And you see here, the red line is the uh, hottest spot, the hottest pixel. And, and the green is a, an average, three by three average. And you see that we don't get beyond 43 degrees or something where the cursor is. And you can move the cursor and get that graph on every pixel that you mark. And these are phase images. These are not anatomical images. This is why they look so strange. And the temperature appears here as you know, a, bright, a bright spot. And if the, uh, the blob, the white blob, is not in the center of the uh, rectangle, it means that it was not heated up in the desired spot. And the physician, basically, with the move of the mouse, can, can steer it or cause steering of the beam uh, to the desired spot. So once he is satisfied with where uh, the point is, then uh, he's confronted with another challenge. And I don't know how many of you have been in uh, a talk given here uh, a few months ago uh, from a guy from Duke who I fo forgot his name. Uh, what time is that? Yeah, Guillermo gave a talk and he talked about DBS. Um, uh, and the problem that in order to know where to treat, you don't see anything on the MR. There's no abnormality, unlike tumor. So you need to rely on an atlas. And this atlas was created, I don't know, in the 19th century based on brains of two nurses. This is the, the legend that he talked about. Uh, so in order really to know where it is, you either need to put an electrode. This is what they do in DBS. or with ultrasound, you can also touch it. I mean, the force will create a sensation. And since the patient is awake, he will tell you, I sense this and this, or my, my tremor is increasing, is decreasing. I, I get a sensation you know, in the tip of my finger. And the neurosurgeon knows, based on that feedback, to steer the beam towards the best point where he needs to ablate. So the treatment goes after he puts it in what he thinks the right place is. He increases the energy uh, slowly, uh, what we call thermal dose. And he, based on the uh, feedback from the patient, he will steer it until he finds the right one. And he will induce two or three shots at full energy. And you see here, the brain tissue is more sensitive than regular tissue. So it's enough to hit it to 55 degrees or so. and. Uh, conclude the treatment. And this is the end of the treatment. So you see the handwriting after the treatment of John. And you can compare it to what you guessed. And the scribble that I told you, look at those scribbles. One was a period. He was trying to put a period. And the other one was the three, right? Look. This is the period. And this is three. Okay. And this is the same day, immediately after the treatment. So the cure is immediate. Actually, in the magnet, you could already see the difference because there is a nurse that will, after each sonication, we call it sonication, the burst of energy, will go to the patient and she'll 
uh, instructing to do this test of bringing uh, the patient finger to her finger to see, you know, to judge the tremor. How much time? We have? Okay. This is uh, what the physician sees. Okay, the physician looks at MRI. You see the uh, you see the point that was treated is is the uh, dark one, and there is edema around the around it that will vanish after a few months. But it doesn't create any side effects, nothing. So this is a in three month follow up. You see how steady his hand is. This is the hand he couldn't eat with. You remember the uh, cereal. Okay. And by the way, uh, okay. right hand. You see, he has tremor in his right hand, but uh, we are only allowed to treat only one side of the brain. In order to get rid of both sides, you need to treat it in two places. Right now, it is allowed to treat only in one side. And the reason is because there is no undo button. Once you ablate it, that's it. So in order not to uh, leave the patient, I mean the risk of leaving the patient without uh, any capability, right now only uh, one side Are is allowed tired? to be treated. So these are standard tests to measure, you know, the amount of uh, tremor. So he can, he can now do it without spilling the water. And this is, again, comparison of his test before and after. And, and this, is, this is, as I said, happens immediately after the treatment. OK. This is an interview with John and his wife. And uh, it certainly listen has to been what he says to both his because wife says. I've been able to, um, I've been able to uh, eat peas and soup <laughs> and salad and all those difficult things. I've been able to uh, uh, drink wine with my right, with my hand, my dominant hand, drink wine or whatever is on the table, uh, go to social events without heavily medicating myself, and even to put my uh, golf tea uh, in the golf ground, tea, the, this is the basis of, golf of the golf tea in the ground with my right hand. The night before, when he was going through, of course, I didn't sleep all night, and I said, "Honey, I'm with you. Whatever you turn out to be, I will stay with you and help you and take care of you." Um, and then I didn't sleep all night, and then um, the next morning, I was re as I was relieved and just. I think it was the happiest moment of my life to see him normal, healthy, and happy, and he had very little tremor. That was miraculous. She was she was afraid she's going to lose him, basically. So uh, this is why she said this was the happiest moment of my life, not of his life. And you, you have to think about it, that when a, a person suffers from such a disability, it affects the whole family, basically. Uh, so I think this is a very important message. Okay, so just to complete the picture uh, on the brain, brain is not just uh, you know, functional disorders, and I added here, except the movement, there were people treated for neuropathic pain, like phantom pain. I'm sure you heard about phantom pain. This is an experience that is sort of uh, scribbled or written into the brain. It's not coming from any sense or physical source, and by basically ablating those neurons that store that experience, people are able to get rid of a very debilitating condition. Because it's not only that they feel pain, they take uh, medication, and some of, some of them take you know, morphine and stuff that make them inhuman, basically unable to function. Tumors is the next uh, neck thing. As I said, from a regulatory perspective, it's very difficult because there are surgical options right now. Uh, and uh, for a clinical trial, they'll give you only patients who have no other 
option, and typically they are in a very late stage and, and difficult situation anyway. Stroke is uh, still in a preclinical research, and I'll talk about it later. Uh, I'll talk about all the those three later. I have a section for the future. <coughs> what is the status today? So a typical answer that I get asked uh, where such treatment are um, offered. In Israel, there is no brain uh, system that is approved for use, for clinical use. There are only uh, the body system that you see here in the picture uh, for treating uterine fibroids, pain palliation of bone metastasis, and some other experimental uh, treatment. Uh, we have a system in Rambam, and there is a system in Sheba in Israel. There are over 100 systems worldwide. There are, I think, something like eight brain systems uh, in Korea, Japan, US, uh, and Switzerland, I think, and Canada. Um, so uterine fibroid, this is a benign uh, growth in the uterus. Uh, it's very uh, prevalent in women above a certain age. Uh, it's not a life-threatening disease, like, you know, like essential tremor is not, not life-threatening, just quality of life debilitating condition. And the same with uterine fibroid, because there are pain symptoms, heavy bleeding, uh, uh, frequent urination, uh, which is a problem for many women in their you know, daily life. And this is an old surgical alternative that preserves also fertility. And if we have time, I'll show you uh, a short clip. This was approved by the FDA in 2004. And we'll talk later about the challenges that this approach faces. And we'll discuss a little bit why it's not offered freely to every woman every woman. Uh, bone metastasis, actually I need to fix the slide because the FDA uh, approved it. Uh, people with bone metastasis are late stage uh, patients. I mean, they have no cure in, in the medical terms and the only thing uh, physicians can do is help them with the pain, typically with drug uh, and radiation. Radiation doesn't help to like 40% of the patients. And what was shown in this study that uh, focus ultrasound uh, can deal both with as a first line treatment and also for those patients for whom radiation therapy does not help. Again, the pain relief is immediate. People return, you know, to travel, to go work uh, as farmers. There was a, a farmer that went back, you know, to ride his horse. He couldn't do it for years. Uh, so really from a point of view of quality of life, it's not that, actually they live longer, that was another side effect of the study because they take less medication. So, you know, less toxics in their body. But, but we all doomed to die at the end. So at least with good quality of life is, is what we aspire for. Um, the other indication that uh, is being now uh, studied in, in clinical setting is prostate. It's it's the breast cancer of the, of the man. Uh, almost uh, every, <coughs> every male will die with prostate cancer, not because of. Uh, so there is a big debate whether it needs to be treated or not. Uh, in the US, there is this culture, you know, I want to get rid of it. So many American males opt for surgery and actually to robotic surgery. They think it's safer for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, breast cancer uh, is being offered in Japan um, on a regular basis. Uh, it saves, uh, again, lumpectomy. It saves uh, you know, cosmetic surgery in most breast uh, cancer. <coughs> uh, you have to undergo also, women have to undergo also cosmetic surgery. And I don't know if you know, in regular surgery, Around 30% of the women have to come back for a second operation because the end point of the uh, intervention is when the specimen or the answer from the pathology lab coming back negative, that all the tissue that was removed during the surgery is clean from cancer cell. And the physician has no way to see or feel, palpate the tissue and, and know in real time whether, you know, the 
surgery is complete or not. Actually, there is a Israeli company that recently got an FDA approval doing medical for a device, RF device, that will measure you know, the impedance. But the practice is, in, in most cases, 30% go to second surgery. And I ask the women here in the audience, you know, three weeks to wait for a phone call, whether you need to go back. I mean, this by, by itself can kill you. So uh, the results with the uh, study, and now it is offered commercially, but the results were that this is 100% success, I mean, in terms of efficacy, no side effects, no cosmetic surgery, women are living without cancer. Uh, liver cancer um, can be actually performed in a very limited setup. And I, I hinted earlier, you know, I said if the patient or the organ is not moving, and liver clearly moves. So the only way to treat uh, tumors in the liver is by uh, performing a breath hold. And this cannot be done voluntarily, so the experimental treatment in the liver uh, were done under full anesthesia with a ventilator. This is the machine that caused respiration. And at a certain point in time, there is a short uh, apnea, which is a breath hold induced. So the liver stays in, in one known place, and it can be ablated. These were successful treatment just to show feasibility. I mean, the, the, the patients are OK. Everything is OK. But there is another uh, limitation. This is only a small part of the liver extend below the rib cage. So really, in order to treat any part of the liver, you need to be able to do it through the rib. And this is another challenge I'll talk, to, I'll talk about in a moment. OK, I think we have, we have uh, two minutes for this slide. This is a, a woman that underwent. After having MRG fuss, it was life changing. You can tell such a difference. Actually, my abdomen went down um, as soon as I had the procedure. So that was very cool. I was working out in three to four days. So that was wonderful. I have lighter periods, uh, no pain. Um, intercourse is wonderful and no pressure on my abdomen. I'm back to a sense of just being normal, being a full woman. I don't have any concerns, and it's just, it's great. So from what she tells about after, you can understand what was not wonderful before. And here she is with her daughter that was born like a year and a half after the treatment, okay? And actually, there are, I think, like by now, like 100 babies, most of them born with uh, natural delivery, uh, not C-section. Uh, and they are healthy. Average weight is 3.3 uh, kilogram. So it seems like a very safe uh, procedure. So just to summarize, basically, we have here uh, a new modality which allows us to close the loop using the MR, close the loop on the treatment. Uh, and, and what you see here. Basically, the green spots are the planned one. This is a uterine fibroid treatment. And the blue one are the ones that were treated. And this is measured by the thermal dose, the temperature that the tissue reached. So the physician can see at any time what was covered, what was not covered. If this is a can cancer tumor it, and, and there is a hole, you know, he can fill it. So it's like painting, you know, painting the organ with, uh, with ultrasound. Um, you can understand from this that uh, the treatment is not very fast, and we'll discuss that in a moment. So these are the challenges. So first of all, technology, because uh, this is Technion is Institute of Technology, so we talk about technology. So I, I hinted about organ motion. And uh, in order to be able uh, to treat a freely breathing person who, are, who is awake, you need to be able, first of all, to image in real time with the MR, and then to be able to steer the beam, slave it to the MR image, I mean, detect the target, slave it to the uh, MR image, and ablate. Uh, there is a feasibility study that uh, I was involved in in, in Stanford, a preclinical done on pigs, live pigs, uh, moving uh, organ with a transducer, uh, Again, same size, the body transducer with 1,000 elements. 
that has 3D steering capabilities, so the beam can be steered in all directions uh, electronically, so there's no problem of delay, latency, and so on. And they developed MR uh, scan algorithms that can do sort of four frames per second, which seems to be enough given the speed of the, uh, the, movement, the, the movement velocity of the lever. It would not be enough for cardiac treatment, for example, but at this point, it is enough uh, for that. Uh, I'll jump to the third point because it's the same context. In order to go through the uh, ribs, we need very large array, th many thousands of elements, and it's not a problem to build it mechanically, but the electronics looks like a mainframe computer of you know the 50. So there is a big challenge in uh, harnessing you know microelectronics, MEMS, especially MEMS, in order to uh, reduce the electronics to a size and cost that is, is commercially feasible. And the speed of treatment is, uh, is another issue. As you saw, you know, you have to rust, basically raster scan. And the larger the volume you have, the longer it takes. Um, the most time consuming element of the treatment is the radiologist looking at the pictures that he gets. So if the system could be made automatic, it could be much faster. But there is also uh, some, I would say, advanced uh, techniques in order to measure the residual heating of the tissue and not wait until everything cools down to baseline. Remember, MR measures temperature rise, not the absolute temperature. So there is residual heat <coughs> in the uh, near field. And if you are not careful and do, do it too fast, it will cause damage you know, in the near field. OK. Commercialization is the major challenge that the company faces right now. First of all, regulation. This is what is called class three device. I mean, the, the riskiest in terms of the FDA terminology. So it has to undergo the whole, call, they call it nine yard, phase one, two, and three, safety, efficacy, and scalability, large, you know, large scale trial. This takes a lot of time. Recruiting the patient, follow up time, submitting to the FDA, the FDA process. So, if uh, uterine fibroid, the company started to work on it in 99, FDA was given at the end of 2004. And then we started to work on the bone metastasis. Bone metastasis is last year, uh, 2012. So, you can get a, a feeling to how difficult it is. Now, it doesn't end up with uh, you know, regulatory approval, because then you have to convince the Kupot uh, Cholim, uh, I mean the healthcare uh, providers or insurance company, to reimburse the procedure. And uh, some of them see it, or most of them see it, as a risk to their business, not as a you know, good offer to the patient. Because, for example, with uterine fibroids, most women will defer hysterectomy, which is getting the uterus out until they have no choice. But if the procedure is almost cosmetic, you go in, you go out, that's it. Then every, every, women, every woman with you know, even a small fibroid that is not symptomatic might like it. So they lose money. So this is another big challenge. And, and only through push of, you know, of the crowd of women uh, asking for it, it will happen. Because if a woman goes to a gynecologist today, and ask about the treatment, he will tell her, look, why do you need it? It's experimental, it's new, let's wait. I can take your uterus, you won't suffer anymore. That's true, she will not have a uterus. There will be no issue with the uterus, but there will be, be many other issues. And the reason they take this position is because they don't own the MR, and they will lose money if they don't perform the surgery. And I'm sorry to say that, but this is the reality of the medical uh, profession. And this relates to turf wars. The fact that you know, it uses MR, creates a big problem, a big entry uh, barrier to entry to the company. And I don't see, you know, personal MR coming anytime soon to us. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the future. And the first is a class of application which use the low uh, power spectrum of ultrasound. Yes, 
Uh, the first one is uh, ultrasound-mediated drug delivery. And the concept here is that you encapsulate a molecule. And we see it here. Th this is the drug molecule that can be very toxic to the body. It is encapsulated with something that makes it inert. And you only activate it using focus ultrasound at the point that you want to deliver it. Okay? So you use an external, if you like, physical force in order to activate the drug. This is one uh, area in which there's a lot of work right now. The second one is getting drugs to the brain. In the brain, we have a special barrier called the blood-brain barrier that doesn't allow large molecules to enter the brain. This is why chemotherapy is not effective. And it was shown that by using uh, low power focused ultrasound, you can actually poke a hole which is reversible. It will close within, an hour, within hours. And then you can uh, take a drug, you know, and it will reach the brain. And then there are all kind of uh, things associated with uh, blood clots, uh, deep uh, vein DVT, what is called DVT, uh, stroke, both types, like Eric Sharon had, and other cardiac conditions that I don't have to talk about much right now. But they are all very experimental. I mean, this is, uh, uh, some of them are uh, in vitro, I mean preclinical, before animals, some um, pre animal state. And last but not least is nerve stimulation. The ability to actually treat psychiatric disorder like depression and other conditions. Uh, there's a work here done by Professor Shai Shoam and Nathan Kimmel in, in biomedical. And there's a new magnet uh, program that I was part of uh, establishing uh, with those companies and academia to uh, research this area, come uh, with new targets for treatment to know where you know, to touch or hit or apply RF energy. It depends. Every company here does it in a different way. Brainway is uh, basically also a helmet with RF. I mean, it's an RF field that they induce. I'm reaching the end of my talk. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer. I would like to acknowledge, first of all, the patient. You have to appreciate those people who volunteer for studies that involve risk, to the partners, clinical research partners that do the uh, research, to Insight Tech, and to the Focused Ultrasound Foundation that tries you know, to bring uh, the message to the world. And be happy and be healthy. Thank you. Happy to take questions.